Can I start by asking you this Yemeni based group, how big do you think they are? Give us an idea of how big they are and where they're getting their, their weapons. The Houthis have expanded massively their areas of control since a civil war in Yemen started at the end of 2014, so about a decade ago now. And they now control territory in which about two thirds of Yemen's population live. And that's mostly along the western side of the country. It's very hard to tell to what extent they rule by fear and to what extent they rule by consensus. But the fact is that they have about 20 million people in their areas and that they are managing to recruit more fighters on the back of what they're doing in the Red Sea and in terms of firing missiles and drones at Israel. That has proven quite popular inside Yemen and it's increased their base. Now, as to the second part of your question, where are they getting their weapons from? There's very strong evidence to suggest that their weapons are coming from Iran and that they're becoming ever more sophisticated. It supports you saying inside Yemen. We've also heard, of course, the head of Hamas congratulating that Houthi group for the missile that they launched at the weekend. Houthis have been very clear in their support for Hamas, for uh, the Palestinians in general. That's changing the way the group is seen, is it not, on an international level? Is it perhaps even changing the way the group is seeing itself? Yes, I think so. For over 20 years now, the Houthis have been brandishing a slogan which includes the words death to Israel, death to America, a curse on the Jews and victory for Islam. And that clearly chimes very well with what Hamas and other elements in Iran's so-called axis of resistance seek. Now, internationally and regionally, the Houthis have drawn massive publicity through their attacks uh, in the Red Sea against shipping and against Israel directly, which are framed as being defensive of the Palestinian people and their right to sovereignty. So the Houthis have really caught a zeitgeist here and they've pitched themselves really as the sole defenders of Palestine in a region where many uh, regimes will not come out publicly in favour of Palestine. So they found a niche. Mm. Uh, now, of course, Israel vowed revenge. Uh, the Houthis... I don't want to say they're immune, but they do seem to have some part of a resilience to attacks because we've seen Israel already uh, have re revenge strikes on port cities held by the Houthis, but they seem to have this defence system. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Yes, the Houthis are very well used to attacks against them. They've been at war actually on and off for about two decades now, not just the most recent civil war. So, in a sense, fighting is in their DNA. They have weathered and survived over 25,000 airstrikes by Saudi Arabia over the past uh, nine years. And they're not intimidated. They haven't been intimidated by US and UK airstrikes against them that began in January. And of course, Israel's very uh, significant bombing of Hudeda port at the end of July, following a Houthi drone attack that reached Tel Aviv and killed one Israeli. They do not seem to be deterred by force. And that's very important because we have to understand that the Houthis operate by a different logic from what we in the West are perhaps used to. They're very confident. They feel they've won the civil war. They're not afraid of the US, Israel and their allies, and they have a high tolerance for casualties on their own side. So this is a very significant enemy. Uh, we, we're talking about the, the, the strikes that they've put into Israel, but I also mentioned the, the attacks that we've seen over the last year on the Red Sea, on, on a variety of tankers, a lot of oil tankers, massive impact there, both on international trade and indeed the environment. That's right. The Houthis have been attacking shipping in the Red Sea since November last year. And interestingly, since the US and the UK started to retaliate with airstrikes against the Houthis in January this year, the Houthis have only increased their attacks. And the trouble for, for those fighting the Houthis is that they do not... The Houthis do not have to be accurate. It's a very asymmetric war. The Houthis simply have to keep going. So even if their stockpiles are reduced, even if some of their missile launches are destroyed, they just need to keep lobbing missiles out there without necessarily having to be accurate in order to disrupt Red Sea shipping. For them, not losing is winning. And for us, 
having any kind of disruption to the Red Sea does affect ultimately our economies. And that brings what's happening in the Middle East, a faraway war, right home to roost where we are. Not losing is winning in their eyes. Now we are, we're hearing, you know, he said, she said a bit with the, the Houthis saying that, well, the US is open to talks with them, that they're open to recognising the capital of Yemen, Sana'a, as their capital, US now denying that. But is there, to your knowledge, any sort of negotiation between these two sides, the Houthis and, and the other side? Well, the Houthis have been engaged in talks uh, generally over their own civil war in Yemen, in which, of course, the US has been involved as a supporter of the Saudi-led coalition that has been fighting the Houthis. It's quite a complex war. So talks have been ongoing. The issue with these talks is that the Houthis understand that, for them, threats work. If they continue to threaten, then they continue to get concessions. And that's happened ever since the Stockholm Agreement of 2018, the truce of 2022. They simply want more. Now, I wouldn't be surprised if there are talks also involving the US at this point to help the, find a way of getting the Houthis to cease their attacks in the Red Sea, which are hurting our shipping. But I think we're a very, very long way off finding something that could be a lasting uh, ceasefire, let alone a peace. Uh, Dr. Kendall, I, I believe you've travelled extensively in Yemen. As you're saying, it's, you know, uh, we're a decade into the civil war there. The Houthis feel that they've won it. But can you give me an idea of what the current situation is like there, notably for the Yemeni people? Yes, in all of this, the Yemeni people themselves often get forgotten, but they are suffering incredibly. There have been about uh, nine to ten years of war in the most recent round. Their economy is imploding. Most recently, they've suffered huge flooding. And, of course, a state that's at war is very... It's very difficult for them to cope with the fallout of that. That leads to cholera. And we have, between... 60 and 80 percent of Yemen's 30 million plus population in need of some kind of humanitarian aid. So it's a very dire situation inside Yemen itself. Yeah, indeed. And unfortunately, with international news, once one, another conflict starts, we tend to take our eyes off one that is still ongoing. Uh, Dr. Elizabeth Kendall, thanks so much for joining us and giving us your time here on France 24.